Now, um, if you're willing, I hope you are. You don't have to, but if you are, if you're willing, would you share uh, what labor, um, what your labor is, what labor do you do? Or if you're retired, what was your occupation? Okay? You might be retired, or you might still be in the workforce. Now, uh, Wednesday night, Brother Louie, uh, he's obviously up north with his family, but um, he told me that there are 40 million, um, uh, I don't know exactly how he said it, 40 million people, I think is what he said, that that uh, have withdrawn from the labor force or the you know the workforce here in America. And then I can't, wish I could remember how he said it, but uh, it, it's they're treating it like an illness. They're, you know, do you know the word he put to it, Brother Mark? I think of the word, but they're but the. Um, the uh, government is treating it as some form of illness. These folks have become, have succumbed to this illness and they've withdrawn from the labor force. And that's what Louie was telling me this, you know, so I'm just, and I thought, you know, how interesting is that? Um, you know, and uh, by the way, I still see a lot of help wanted as I, I'm out and about driving here and there and hither and yon. I see a lot of help wanted signs. And maybe you do too. Like I've never seen in my entire life. I mean, you know, I, I mean, right, we've always seen a few help wanted here and there. But, uh, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just like everywhere, you know, help wanted. So uh, I'll try to find out what Louis exact uh, what they're calling this, what they're treating it as some form of illness, some kind of a complex, but uh, anyway, so, but here's my question uh, for you. Um, uh, what I want to find out for both a man and a woman, what I'd like to find out this morning, and I hope you'll help me to do that, um, is uh, how long did you work in your occupation, the labor that you did, how long, and you know, um, it, it, it doesn't need to be, um, you know, it doesn't need to be um, uh, all, in, all in, you know, like consecutive years in a row, uh, but I, I'm looking for a total, a total number of how long did you labor could it be 20 years, 30 years? I don't know. You tell me, but uh, who will begin? What was your occupation and how long did you labor? Over here, Sister Jocelyn. I was a court clerk for over 30 years, and I retired in about 20 years. Well, praise God. Amen. I mean, uh, you know, and let me tell you, you don't hear very often nowadays somebody in the same occupation for over three decades. Was it 30, like 31 years, would you say? Close to 31. Like, okay, so, because that, that's important. Uh, thank you, sister. And Lenora's hand was up. Fifty years! Wow! All right. Well, I'm so glad that uh, that I asked, and I appreciate that. All right. Someone else? Anyone else? Uh, okay, Brother Cecil. Oh wow. Delta Airlines for 30, would you say 31 years? Wow, well, good morning, folks. Come on in. Welcome. Good to have you here. And uh, all right. Um, now, Mrs. Ellis, could you keep track? So 
Jocelyn, uh, 30, 31 years. Uh, Lenora, uh, and by the way, this, this is my neighbor, Antoine. Good to have you folks. God bless you. Thank you for accepting the invite and joining us here today. Uh, good to have you folks. And uh, you see, not everybody's left the valley for the last hoorah of summer. There's still some of us still here. Now, uh, and Brother Michael, yes. 26 years. Well, Air Force, Post Office. Total 26 years. You, you labored uh, a total of, so, um, so how long in the Air Force? 20. 20. And then in the, in, 26. in 26 years. And still working. And you're still employed. You're still, you're still employed. Wow. That's all government work, isn't it? Both of those. That's government work. Okay, um, did you get that, Mrs. Ellis? So we want to keep track of these. Uh, yeah, Brother Rick. 50 years and 50 years. Did you say 50 years? 50 years on that side. And in uh, the cooking industry. And pff, were they looking for folks that know how to cook in Las Vegas, Nevada, aren't they? You could probably go back and get a job. You go out there and get it. Huh? Yeah. You, they, yeah, and did you say 40 years in this town? All right. You need to know how to cook something? There's your man right there. In fact, you writing this down, Mrs. Ellis? And uh, Brother Rick and teaming up with Brother Cecil uh, for uh, the, what is the date of the, uh, Brother Cecil? Now, we went, we rehearsed this. What, what is the date for the 61st anniversary of this church? 26th. Oh, praise the Lord. I don't have to hold you in for recess now. You get to go out. Amen. Uh, the 25th. This month is the 61st anniversary of Gateway Baptist Church. Now, I'll get to the rest of you. I hadn't forgotten you. Did you know, would you believe we're going to have a dunk tank on the church field. You know what a dunk tank is, right? How many of you have ever been in a dunk tank? You've been in a, inside of a dunk tank? I was in a dunk tank, and I spent the better part of two hours under the water. And uh, it was members of this church that kept me under the water. And you know, I don't know uh, to this day what compelled you to you know, to, uh, to keep me under the water like that. But, um, you know, I had swimmers here for quite a while. And, but uh, this year it's Brother Marcel and uh, Brother Jason. They're going to be on the hot seat of the dunk tank. And would you believe, do you have those special softballs? Do you have those with you? She's got them at home. She's, she's holding the softballs in her hand leading up to this event. She's getting the feel of the weight, the stitching on the softballs. And it's, well, yeah, it's, uh, and I'll tell you what, Brother Jason is, uh, can I say, He's at the borderline of losing it. I mean, it, I don't know what it is, a son-in-law and his mother-in-law. and But he's always reminding his mother-in-law that he is her number one favorite son-in-law. It's like he's trying to pound it into her mind, you know. Uh, but anyway, I think it's hopeless. I think he's in... A lot of trouble is what I think. So, so we've got that. We've got a big, for all the kiddies, we've got a big, huge uh, bounce house with all kinds of activities on that. We've got the barbecue. We've got uh, the horseshoes, um, a horseshoe tournament, which, uh, are you still at the, are you still king of the mountain? You got knocked off? Was it Brother C.L.? Did you did you win the throne last horseshoe? I think it's you. I think it is you, Brother C.L. He's he's at the top of he's at the top of the mountain. So you know what? 
All right. Get practiced up. So lots of events, lots of activities. Um, we do have some uh, singers that'll be uh, that'll be joining us. We have uh, we we have the now men. What are we doing? What are we doing? That the twenty fourth, the Saturday before the big day, the men stake out. The men stake out. And men, you're going to have a you're going to have a guest speaker at the men stake out. You don't want to miss the steak, and you don't want to miss the guest speaker. Saturday evening. Now. Don't forget this, Brother Cecil. Five to seven, Saturday evening. Five to seven, Saturday evening. And uh, so, you know, uh, we'll keep announcing it. But uh, And we may pitch a few horseshoes on that evening as well, you know. So it's going to be a great time. Um, all right. Now, Brother Seal, your hand was up about your occupation and for how long uh, did you do the work you did? All right, all right. Wow. I mean, you know, how often do you hear that? 37 years. Okay. Anyone else? This is what I did, and this is how long I did it. Maybe you're still doing it. Brother Mark. 37 years, construction management. Wow, construction management. You know, as you drive around the valley in some of these buildings, I wouldn't be surprised if Brother Mark had his hand in it here and there. Some of the houses, the new housing, and and 37 years, and you're still you're still employed. I, as far as I know, you're still okay. Yeah, sure. Amen. Amen. He never left. All right. Well. Hey, guys, we'll have a sign-up sheet. We'll have a sign-up sheet. We need to know. For obvious reasons, we need to know, right? We, we need to know how much food to prepare. And so we'll have a sign-up sheet for the men's stakeout. And then, ladies, what big event do you have this month that's all part of the 61st anniversary? Do you ladies recall, and what's the day and the time? All right, Tuesday the 20th. So ladies, your fellowship is Tuesday the 20th. So there's a lot, a lot on the calendar. 6 p.m. All right, ladies, don't miss it. All right, was that, was that everyone? This is my occupation. It's Labor Day weekend. We're celebrating the working man, the working woman. And uh, this is uh, what I do, and this is how long I've done it. Anyone else? Okay, yes, Chantel. Um, I've been an engineer uh, for 15 years, whether it's uh, a nurse's aide, a bullpen striker, and then I became a nurse, and then a nurse technician for 35 years. A total of 50 years? Starting as a little pain. Well, that counts. Yep, that counts. Yep. All right. 50 years. And, and you're an answer to prayer that you're here, and I want you to know that uh, we are committed to pray with you uh, through uh, this uh, health trial that you're that you're in, and I want you to know that. And I want to thank yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. A heart transplant. Uh, so we are, uh, we're committed to stay with you uh, right on through this. Amen. So, well, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you folks are still here. We're missing folks. It's the last uh, opportunity to escape um, for the summer, Labor Day. And I hope your Labor Day is, is a happy one, a blessed one. All right. Did I miss anybody? You may have had your... This is what I do. This is what my labor is, my occupation. This is what I do. You know, hey, God bless you. Thank God. Thank God if you've got, if you're blessed with employment. Amen. Thank God. I mean, you know, I, 
whatever whatever the syndrome is that 40 million people have contracted i i thank god i i i, I have not gotten that uh and i hope i don't get it you know but wow all right is that everybody okay mrs ellis i need to know uh the man here this morning with the longest uh you know uh amount of time at his occupation and I need to know the woman at, with the longest time at her occupation so well you know what that's 150 years of total combined labor and I say God bless you that you deserve a good cup of coffee right here so all right uh, see me, I'll have these for you after uh, service. And, um, but I only bought two. I didn't, you know, I mean, leave it to me. Not to realize that we'd have a tie at 50 years employment with uh, these dear ladies. So I'll be picking another one of these up for, uh, who was our, who was the man, that, uh, Rick. So Brother Rick, uh, this may try your patience, but I'll have one of these. We'll give these to the ladies, ladies first, and then we'll we'll get you on the rebound there. All right. Again, good to see all of you here, and, and thank you for sharing a, a little bit. Those of you that were willing, you didn't have to, but I uh, I really I deeply appreciate that you would. And uh, let's let's uh, see what God in His Word will say to us about. Uh, what we're celebrating this Sunday, labor, labor. Uh, it's Labor Day weekend. And, uh, you know, I really hope you have thanked God for the blessing of employment, work, whatever it is God has, you know, given you to do and set before you to do. Uh, and I know I'm very thankful. Uh, and Miss, Mrs. Ellis, uh, help me out. I entered the ministry in uh, 1980, and so what's what's my total for, huh? 42, thank you, amen, 42 years, amen, 42 years, and um, I, uh, I am so thankful, I am so thankful for God's calling, for his grace, his strength, uh, to God be the glory. And uh, I give all of that to him. Now, um, all of that aside, who can tell me when did Labor Day begin? Well, don't all answer at once. I mean, you're, that, that would be overwhelming too. <laughs> right. Did you know the Bible tells us when Labor Day began? Are you aware of that? Would you like to see it? First book of the Bible, Genesis. So let's find out when Labor Day began. And uh, yeah, I'm just like the rest of you. I just I turn and and look these up, these Bible verses. But uh, here's the answer. And what an answer it is. Uh, Genesis chapter three, and then we want to drop down to verse number nineteen. So. All right. <laughs> Boy, look at this answer. Uh, Adam and Eve have just fallen into sin. You know, and uh, they're just like the rest of us. You know, I mean... The one thing God told them, commanded them not to do... I mean, God gave them countless things that they could do. But the one thing God commanded them not to do, guess what they did? See? I mean, nothing's changed. I mean, here it is, uh, verse 19, Genesis chapter 3. So they've fallen. They've fallen. They, they, um, they're made... They are compelled to leave the Garden of Eden. There's another tree in the garden. God does not want them 
accessing that tree. It's, uh, it's the tree of life. And they are literally driven out of the Garden of Eden. Eden means paradise. And it's an act of mercy. It is an act of mercy on the part of God. Because in their fallen state... Um, sickness, heartbreak, all kinds of suffering. Uh, I mean, do you realize what the first criminal act was right after they fell into sin? Does anybody know the first, the first heartbreak they had to deal with after they sinned against God? It was murder. It, it, it was uh, uh, their oldest son murdered. Um, Cain slew Abel. And so, uh, I mean, you know, you think about everything we, that we go through, everything in life we have to deal with. Uh, I mean, it's beyond me to, uh, to uh, speak uh, adequately to all the suffering, all the hardship, all the heartbreak, all the pain that people, you know. Um, but had they been left in, in the Garden of Eden and been able to get to the Tree of Life, do you know, do you understand what that would have meant for the human race, for all of mankind. Had they gotten to the tree of life, it would mean then that all of mankind would be in a perpetual state of pain and suffering and heartbreak and sickness and uh, crime and hatred and so in an act of mercy God kept them away from the tree of life now they did get to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they partook and guess what they learned from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil they learned how to become evil <laughs> that's what they got from that you you know and uh, so mankind has uh, lived with the consequences of that for these 6,000 years, okay? So, but now here it is, um, verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. There it is. The first mention of Labor Day. You say, well, geographically, where was this located? No, it's not the Mojave. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's in the Middle East. It's in the Middle East, where temperatures, you know, still today reach about 130 degrees during the, uh, the heat of uh, summer. Yeah, in the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, now, you know, I'm going to read to you a number of verses here. And um, I want you to notice in these verses that God has a way, uh, in his word, God has a way of bringing us again and again and again to the brevity of life. God has a way of, he has a way of causing us to think about, you know, that, we don't have an endless number of tomorrows here upon the earth. I mean, look, uh, do I really, would I really need to prove that? And, and if, if somebody were to press upon me and say, well, can you prove that? I mean, because I, I just feel like, I just feel like this Labor Day weekend, I, I'm just going to, I mean, I'm going to live here on the earth forever, you know. But that's a sobering illustration, but how many of us have attended a memorial service of a loved one? Do I need to say more? The brevity of life. You know, we, we have a date that we're born, 
And then there's another date that we pass into eternity. And the dash in between the birth date and the date of your passing is called your life. You see? And so uh, look at this in verse 19. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, one of these, uh, one of the universities uh, did uh, research. Do you know what they discovered about the human body? The exact 98 minerals and elements found in the dust, this is going to surprise you, are in fact the exact 98 minerals and elements found in the human body. Should we be surprised about that? The book says God made us from the dust, and then he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and we became a living soul. Kind of puts a dent, doesn't it, in evolution there. Um, but so there it is. Uh, now, um, next book over, please. Exodus, just one book, Exodus in chapter 20. Um, uh, where are we going now, preacher? Well, I'm going to show you one verse out of, out of, uh, the 10 commandments. Have you heard of the 10 commandments? The 10 commandments. So just one verse. Here it is, Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 9. So what are we looking at? Well, we're, we're looking at God's command to labor. Did you know that labor is a command of God? Wow, it's, it's what God has commanded, labor. There it is, Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 9. Straight from God, given to Moses, um, when Moses went up to the mount, the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, one of those commandments, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Ah, but there's seven days in a week, but that's right. God wants you to rest. He wants you to rest. Um, and he wants you to rest uh, and to focus on that day of rest, on your relationship with him. And uh, he wants your body to have time to heal and repair. And so uh, I realize a lot of people uh, do not, uh, a lot of people work seven days a week. And if there were eight or more days in a week, they would, they would do that. But God has a purpose and a reason for this commandment. Um, now, what is a Bible work day? Let's, uh, let's find our way to Psalm and uh, chapter 104. That's a little bit more centrally located there in the Bible. Um, what, is a, what is a Bible work day? Did you know the Bible is very, uh, very explicit and uh, we're very, very detailed? God has a lot to say about labor and about work. And so, um, but, uh, you know, um, how many hours of a day do, uh, do we find God uh, giving for what we call a work day? How many hours in a day constitute a Bible work day? And there it is, Psalm, uh, Psalm 104, so, and we'll drop down to verse 23. All right, there it is. Uh, Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until, until what time, class or church? Until the evening. So uh, the day begins at sunrise and the day ends at sunset. So how many hours is that in a day? A Bible work, now this is a Bible work day. This probably does not jive with the Teamsters definition of a, you know, a work day, right? But this, we're talking Bible work day here. It's a 12 hour period. A 12 hour period is, uh, is 
how God defines a work day that he has commanded uh, that, you know, we should, we should work. Now, um, what about, what does the Bible say about retirement? What does it say about retirement? Look at Psalm chapter 90. Stay with me a few minutes here. Uh, just some important information. Uh, it's Labor Day. And uh, God doesn't, you know, uh, leave us uh, without information about labor. Psalm 90, and then if you would drop down to verse number 10. Um, what about retirement? Uh, the days of our years are three score years and ten. So, a score is 20 years, so three score would be 60 years, and then you add the other 10, you've got 70 years, 70 years. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, so now we're four times 20, that's 80 years, yet is there strength, all of those years, is there, is there uh, strength labor? And oh yes, what else is all parcel and part of all of that labor? Sorrow. For it is soon cut off. Now look what God just did. He brings us back to the brevity of life. It is soon cut off. And, and we do what? We fly away. We fly away. So that's got me thinking, all right? So I'm not going to live an endless number of tomorrows here upon the earth. And then when I come to the end of my earthly sojourn, pilgrimage, God just told me I'm going to fly away. Where am I going to fly to? Uh, um, you know, uh, Paul, the apostle, spoke about being absent from the body. See, we, there's a point at which this body, uh, the cessation of the body, the, the death of the physical body, but there's the soul and the spirit within the body, and, uh, and they fly away. The body goes into the grave, but the soul and spirit within, they fly away. So, you know, God, he's constantly bringing us back to, uh, uh, and he wants us to be thinking about where are we going to spend, be spend, you know, spend eternity here. Um, now, um, what does the Bible say about work and food? Food and work, Amen. Um, it's Labor Day. Uh, I, I'm not going to be surprised uh, at all if some barbecues are fired up. Uh huh. You know, people like food, right? People enjoy good food. By the way, tonight, holiday weekend, uh, nachos, hot melted cheese, jalapenos, that's all tonight. And to put the fire out, ice cold, juicy watermelon. That's all tonight after church. It's a holiday weekend, so um, we enjoy good food here. Uh, but what does the Bible say about work and food? Well, if you can, find your way to 2 Thessalonians, and we'll read, we'll read what God says about, uh, about food as it pertains to work. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And then uh, drop down to verse 7, and I'm going to read uh, through verse 12. So, you know, it's like food and work. Why, why are you connecting food and work? What, what does work, what does work have to do with food? Well, let's see what God tells us about work and food here. Um, there it is, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 7. The Apostle Paul says to the church, now he says, for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. The word follow means imitate us, follow our example. 
For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, <clears throat> neither did we eat any man's bread for, what's that next word? For not. Do you know what he just said? Paul said, we were not freeloaders. Wow. I mean, you talk about just putting it out there. That's exactly what he is packed into that statement. He said, the, the bread we ate, he says, we worked for. And look at it, uh, verse um, number eight. Uh, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. We worked for the food that we consumed. For our sustenance, you know. And look at verse 9. Now why? Why did he work for the food? Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. 2,000, now these words written 2,000 years ago are such a picture of what was going on in the world then. The Apostle Paul and those, his companions, who are uh, preaching God's word, starting churches, his example is, to the world then and it's still for the world today is if you want to eat God says then you need to work you need to work if you want to eat wow um, look at this verse 10 for even when we were with you this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Wow. You say, that's tough. That's, that's a hard line. You know what? You know what that is? That's God's will. That's God's plan. If you want to eat, you work. I... Um, I told my wife, what a, what a week. I mean, God has blessed my wife with, and I don't know, maybe, maybe her mama taught her. Her mom was a, an incredible uh, cook, Brother Rick. Uh, you know, and uh, my wife, it rubbed off on my wife. I said, I told my wife this week, I said, wow, honey. I said, uh, what a week. I mean, every, every evening, she had a home-cooked meal prepared for me when I got home from work. And I told her, I said, I said, every single time I sat down to the table, you put a meal before me and, and you just knocked it out of the ballpark. I told her. I just felt so blessed. And you know, and, I, and let me tell you something else. When I came home from work, and I mean, I worked. And, you know, it, it just tasted all the better to me because I put something out than to be able to purchase that food for my dear wife to prepare that food. I said, I thought, man, this is heaven on earth. Wow, it was good, you know. I'm telling you, wow, praise God. I told my wife, I said, you keep this up, I'm never going to want to take you out to eat again, you know. But there's no place I can take her to go out. And I'm serious, I mean, I'm not just kidding you about this. What does a poor fella do when his wife is such a good cook that he, regret, that he, uh, that he um, what's the word, that he dreads having to go out and eat somewhere? And nobody can cook like my wife, I need to tell you. And, um, you know, so it, but it just felt good to sit down to a meal that I had labored for, I'd worked for it, you know. And uh, by the sweat of the brow, you live in the Mojave, 
in the Mojave, you're gonna, it's going to be by the sweat of your brow, you know. Wow! And so uh, there it is. Now, uh, there it is, verse, uh, verse 11. Now look at it. For we hear that there, there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all. Now, now, look at this. They don't work, but the Bible tells us what, they're, what they are doing. It says, but are busybodies. Busybodies. What's a busybody? Somebody who doesn't work has a lot of idle time on their hands. You know what I heard about idle time? Can you help me with this? I, these old sayings, idle time is the, is the devil's workshop. Okay, you know, I see it. And that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're being busybodies, you see. And that's not what God wants. That's, that's disorderly, see. Because uh, that can cause a lot of problems, you know. Verse 12, now them that are such we command and exhort you by our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, this is his word, this is his will, this is his way. Uh, that with quietness, they work. Quietness is the opposite of busybody. Quietness means, you know, take care of your own biz business. And uh, then uh, you work. And then uh, you, eat your own, you eat your own bread. Wow. Uh, what about the motive of labor? Stay with me. We're, we're coming to a conclusion here, but uh, a few more verses I want you to see. What about the motive of labor here? Uh, go to Proverbs chapter 23. I read this, and I mean, it, it, it made me think when I read this in Proverbs chapter 23. So that's back, you know, in the, about the central part of your Bible, the midway part of your Bible, um, Psalms, Proverbs, Psalms is the biggest, uh, you know, book in the Bible, but the Proverbs is right after Psalms. So anyway, Psalm 23, now look at this, uh, I mean, I thought, wow, labor not to be rich, verse 4, do you see that? From the word of God, labor not to be rich. Uh, cease from thine own wisdom. As, I mean, when I read that, because I'm thinking, I'm thinking if God said that, it's because there must be the motivation of working, laboring to be rich. And then look at verse 5, the very next verse. Uh, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Now, I don't know, folks, I heard this. Maybe you, this past week, I mean, it's just, it's hard to get my mind around it. Verse 5, for riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. I don't know how many trillions of dollars the, the, uh, the uh, news reported this past week flew away. Flew away. Mid trillions of dollars just flew away. Uh, people have uh, labored, they've worked, they've put their money into uh, various um, yeah, yeah, investments and in stocks and, you know, whatever, whatever it is they're, they're doing. In the news this past week, I mean, it was just, they talked about what's going on in the world of investment, and then they, I could not believe it. The world, not just this country, the entire world just lost 
trillions and trillions of dollars. It was some unfathomable amount. I thought, are you kidding me? It's gone just like that. Gone just like that. Flew away. I mean, wow. I mean, the wisdom of God's word is powerful. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, um, and then, uh, yeah, 1 Timothy it is. Yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 6 because there's an addendum thought to what we just read in Proverbs just now. Uh, Oh, wow. First Timothy chapter 6. I mean, it's sobered me up. It's like, wow. So God says labor not to be rich because riches take wings like an eagle and they fly away. And that's exactly what happened. And, and the word is they're not coming back anytime soon. There's a lot of stuff going on right now in the world. And uh, it's, not, it's not investment friendly, I guess would be a way to put it. And uh, yeah, so, but I mean, look at this. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number uh, 7, and I'll read through verse 10, but uh, uh, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 7, look what God says. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. What did God just do again? It's the same thing he keeps doing. He keeps bringing us back to the brevity of life. Life is like the morning fog. It's only there for a little time, and then it vanishes. It goes away. See what he just did in verse 7? Uh, it is certain we can carry nothing out. See, when we leave our earthly pilgrimage, how much can we of it can we take with us? God just told us, you're not taking any of it with you. You're not taking any of it with you. See, point is, we're going out. We're going out. See, God keeps reminding us, you're only here. You're only here for a season. And... So, think about, about God. He'll tell you the truth. He'll give it to you straight. Um, so, what does he say in verse 8? He says, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Oh, and I told you, I've never been more content. You know, my wife, you know, and she thinks I'm just saying this, but I mean it. God knows I mean it. You know, when she'll make a meal like that, I'll tell her, I will tell her, and I mean it, and God knows I mean it, this is the best meal you've ever made. She says, you always say that. Do you ever do that? Do you ever say that? I mean, any, any other men? I mean, I'm not just saying it. I don't know how it keeps getting better and better and better, but I don't know. I mean, I don't have to know how. It just does, and I mean every word of it. See, the Bible says, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, see, labor not to be rich, but they that will be rich, those, who, those whose sole ambition in life is to be rich, here's what God says will happen to them. They'll fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, lust means sinful desires, which drown men in destruction and perdition. The word perdition has everything to do with hell. Uh, verse 10, now here's one of the most well-known statements, and I'm thinking you've probably heard it. For the love of money is the what? The love of money is the root of all evil. Um, now, there were some folks uh, in August. Don't ask me how, but they're called insider traders. And they got caught. They got caught. 
they found out about some companies that were going to go on the stock market before they went on the stock market and they had everything set up to buy enormous amounts of that company stock to be the first ones to get it and now they're in trouble. They're being prosecuted. See, the love of money. The love of money will compel people, tempt people to cheat, to deceive, to be dishonest. And wow. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The Bible says, many sorrows. Wow. And then look what uh, look at this. Uh, what about what about does God have anything to say about spending our labor? Isaiah chapter 55. Yes, he does, actually. In Isaiah chapter 55. And you can see it there. In uh, Isaiah chapter 55. And uh, look at this. In verse 2 and 3. Um, does, he, does he say anything about how we spend our labor, our money? Well, here it is. See, God knows everything. He knows what's going on in, in my thought process, my soul, my, my heart, my mind. He, here it is. Isaiah 55, verse 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? I mean, what is, you know, uh, God says, now, I, I don't know if you're hearing any of this. I'm hearing this. And I mean, I'm starting to think, maybe I better listen. But you know what I'm hearing? I'm hearing that because of all of this, uh, um, uh, what, conflict, war, that is going on in the world, and how that it's affecting the supply of food. I'm constantly hearing this. That it's not going to be like it's always been. Um, see, look what God just said. God said, what, what are you doing spending money? For something that, that will not sustain your life. It will not keep you alive. It, it might amuse you. It might entertain you. But, but God says, you know, it's not going to keep you alive. And God is asking, you know, and your labor, look what else he says, and your labor for that which satisfieth not. God says, you're not fulfilled, you're not content, you're not satisfied. I mean, God knows this. He reads us like a book. And it's like, it doesn't matter how much of this, this, that, and whatever else I surround myself with. God says, when he looks at my heart, when he looks at your heart, he says, you're not satisfied. You're not satisfied. <laughs> uh, Hearken diligently unto me. This is God's word. He says, listen to me. And, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness, Now, see, you see what God just, see, did you notice what God just did there? God is moving us from a carnal, physical-centered life, and, he, and he's, you know, you're trying, to, you're trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment in all of these physical things, but God is saying the, the void is not the physical, it's, it's in your soul. God says what, 
What you're looking for has nothing to do with your physical being. It's your soul. God says you're trying to, you're trying to bring all of this stuff into your life. You know, if I just had this and I just had that, and then I'd be happy. And God says, no. He says, the emptiness is in your soul. It's your soul. And he says in verse 3, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. You say, well, preacher, how do I know if my soul has a need? How, do, how does anybody know if their soul has a need? Well, let me ask you a very pointed question right now. If today were the last day of your life here upon the earth, where will you spend eternity? And if you're not able to answer that question matter-of-factly, and if you're honest, and you would say, Preacher, I have no idea. I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. I mean, the book says we're going to fly away. The book speaks about our last day. But I have no idea where I'm going when my life on earth is over. I, I know my life is going to be over. I know I'm supposed to work for the entirety of my life. I understand uh, it's God's command for me to labor and work. And, uh, but, but beyond all of that, I have no idea where I'm going to spend eternity. Well, see, then here's what that means. It means the need is in your soul. Your soul has a an empty place, a void, and there's only one who can fill that void. And uh, Isaiah says, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Now, boy, let's get to the nitty gritty. And then uh, now, uh, what? A, look at this. Would you go to Mark, you know, Ma Matthew, Mark, the New Testament? Here is one of the most riveting questions I've ever read in all of the Bible. And it's found in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and verse number 36. And if possible, I mean, I'd like you to see it. I hope you can look on here. Look at this question. Because this is about Profiting, profiting from your labor, right? But look at this question, Mark 8, verse 36. I hope you can, well, listen, if, you, you know, if you're not looking, listen to this. Here's what God says. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Where are you going to go with that? You can gain everything the world tells you you've got to have to be happy. <laughs> but God is asking you, if you gain everything the world is pushing at you, shoving at you, and you lose your soul. What good is it? What good is it? I mean, what a powerful question. I mean, it, that still sets me up when I read that. Lose your soul. Uh, now, the next book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 12, please. Luke, chapter 12. Luke, chapter 12, 
And uh, just one book further. And verse 16. Now, here, here's a man that had it all. He had it all. He worked. He gained. He profited. He had it all. And Jesus tells us about him, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And that's good. And he thought within himself, this rich man, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. It's kind of like, uh, it's not really, but it's like, the garage, you know what I'm talking about? The garage, after you've been blessed all these years, all of a sudden the garage is not big enough. You know what I'm talking about? The whatever, it's not big enough. So blessed, you know. Um, what, what am I going to do with everything? See, that's his problem. I, I don't have enough room for all of the increase. And I've worked hard. That's his problem. I don't know what to do with it all. You know, then he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. Here's a solution. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and goods. And I will say to my soul, see, soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Now you worked, you saved, you're retired now. Here's the plan. This is the plan. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. See that? Isn't that the plan? You know, work hard, save up. Hopefully you don't lose it all in some bad investment. Uh, but yeah, that's the plan. And then, you know, live out the rest of your life eating, drinking, and in merriment. I mean, you know, see, the plan's been around for thousands of years. Verse 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Who decides when your life ends? You? Is it you? Do you decide? When, the, when your life will end? No, it's God. God decides. And God decided this man's life would end. I mean, here he worked all of his life. He saved and he set. Everything's good to go. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. And God said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? <laughs> See, where are you going to spend forever when your last day, your appointment, it is appointed unto a man once to die, but after this the judgment where, when you fly away, where are you going when you fly away? Now, uh, where are you going when you fly away? See, um, God loves you. God loves you more than I can explain to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That's hell. But have everlasting life. God loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come to this world for the express purpose of taking all of the sins of the world, mine, yours, everybody's sins, into his body, which is what Peter tells us he did. And with 
your sins and my sins in his body. He was nailed to a cross 2,000 years ago. And the Bible goes on to say, Christ died for our sins. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned. Well, preacher, I think I'm going to try to... I'm going to try to work my way to heaven because I'm going to try to keep the Ten Commandments. Uh, I beg your pardon, it's too late. You've, me, you, and the rest of the world has broken God's Ten Commandments. But here's what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. That's death in hell, by the way. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's God's gift. It's God's gift. God's holding a gift out to you. He paid for it by the death, burial, and resurrection of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Christ died for our sins. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, what do I have to do to get it? Well, um, I feel like there ought to be something I should have to do. Well, let's see what God's word says. God says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. Heaven, forgiveness of all of our sins, salvation from hell, it is the gift of God. Well, who paid for it? Jesus paid for it. That's why he came from heaven to earth. We've all sinned. We've all broken God's commandments. There's only one way left to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Oh, my. Powerful, powerful word of God. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, no, but according to his mercy, he saved us. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, and these are the words of Jesus Christ, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me. Let's see. He's just waiting. He's waiting for your invitation to come into your life. That's all he's waiting for. You see, the reason you don't have to work for it is Jesus did all the work for your salvation. And the only thing left for you to do is to be honest with him. What do you mean, be honest with him? Are you willing to agree with him? What he says about you? What does he say about me? Here's what he says about you. He says, you've sinned against God. Are you willing to agree with God about that? Would you be willing to say, God, you told me that I've broken your commandments, I've sinned against you, and yes, God, I'm willing to agree with you. I have. And then would you be willing then to ask him to come into your life? Would you be willing to ask Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins. Would you say, Lord Jesus, 
I agree with you. I've sinned against you. I realize your son had to die to pay for my sins. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that my sins cost you the life of your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who died to pay for my sins. And Lord Jesus, I accept you right now as my Savior. Please forgive me. Save me from hell. Now, let's bow our heads and right there where you are seated. Because you know what? God is right there with you. And I would ask you what I, I believe is the most important question of life. And, and that is, will you accept Jesus into your heart, into your life? Right there where you are. You and God, just you and God. This is between you and God. This is not between you and the church. It's not between you and me. This is between you and God. And right there where you are, would you just say to God, would you just by prayer just say, Dear God, I, I agree with you. And I admit, I've sinned against you in my life, in my lifetime. I admit it. And you could tell him that right now. If you never have, you could just, you could just say, God, I admit it. And, uh, and you could say, dear God, I admit. I understand now that Jesus died to pay for my sins against you, and I'm sorry. This is called repentance, and I'm sorry. And uh, between you and God, right where you are right now, you could just pray, Lord Jesus. And I encourage you, if you've never prayed this before, if you've never if, you, if you're here today and you have no idea where you're going to spend eternity, you, uh, you know for sure you don't want to go to hell, but you have no idea if you're going to heaven. But you know one thing for sure, I do not want to die and go to hell. Uh, then would you pray? Would you pray, dear Jesus, please come into my heart. Please forgive me of all of my sins against God. I accept you, Jesus, right now as my Savior, my Savior from hell. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Father, it's my hope, certainly my prayer, that that you heard someone, that you got right next to someone here today, and you heard them just come into agreement with you about all of their sins against you. They, they acknowledge it. They admit it. <laughs> but that you also heard them pray and ask Jesus to come into their heart into their life, asking Jesus to forgive them of all their sins, to save them from hell. And God, I pray that uh, whether in this sanctuary or those viewing this sermon online, wherever in the world they may be, it's my prayer that many, that many will come to Jesus before it's too late, before they die without him. They die guilty, unforgiven. They die condemned. 
God, it's my prayer that many would accept Jesus before it's eternally too late. While they still have breath, while there's still time, while they still can, oh, I pray you draw them, Father. Draw them to Christ. That is what you do. And I pray the Holy Spirit of God would convict them as they hear the gospel and that they would accept Christ as their Savior. I hope that someone, uh, even today, has done so. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.